Welcome to Binge or Purge Streaming Reviews. I'm your host, Demo. My co-host is Joe Taylor. This is episode 90. 90, man. We're getting close to 100. Yeah, it's only taken us 80 weeks between the last one. Oh, yeah. Hey, with what we get paid, we can take whatever hiatus we want. That's right. Okay, we're on our schedule. Not your schedule, people. (laughs) Though I have gotten a lot of messages going, "Uh, you guys still doing this? Is this still a thing? Yeah. And I'm like... Those are from me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those are from myself as well. I'm like, are we still doing this? That's a good question. I know I've been watching a ton of television this whole time. So I'm like, I really want to talk about this. And then it comes and goes. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to talk about that show. The amount of shows I have watched between our hiatus... They're gone. And the thing is, nothing truly (laughs) memorable. We're like, oh my God, Joe, I can't believe I didn't get to review this. I wanted to tell you about it. I mean, I watched House of the Dragon, sure. I mean, did you House of the Dragon? I tried the first one. I couldn't tell any of the characters apart. They all look the same and all have the same make-believe names. I can see how that was confusing. It took a little while for that one to get going, but I think it brought it home at the end. Now, sure. we're not going to do a deep dive on House of the Dragon. I do want to mention one thing about it, though. Season two, only going to be eight episodes instead of ten. Oh, good. They're that, making th- more. You know what? I'd like to say I missed you, but that would be a lie. <laughs> now, the big show of the last few months that's come and gone already, but I know we want to discuss it, was HBO's original series, The Last of Us. Yeah, based on a video game. From 2013, okay, from creators Craig Mazin and Neil Druckmann. Neil Druckmann made the game. Craig Mazin was the guy that made Chernobyl, which we liked. Now, I think Craig Mazin also hosts a podcast called Script Notes about screenwriting that's very good. Oh, okay. John August and Craig Mazin. I think that's the same guy. I'm sure. Got to be. Yeah. That's a good podcast, too. Script notes. Anyway. Well, good for him. Now, let's just focus on the show, though. Nine episodes, about an hour each. It stars Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey. Typically, shows about video games suck. Do we agree? Yes. This does not. I thoroughly enjoyed this show. And you're looking at me like... No, I'm looking at you because I'm surprised about this show because I liked it too. Oh, you did? First of all, when you say it's a show, or not you, but whoever, it's a show based on a video game, I'm out. I'm like, you should meet my friend Demo. He'll love it, whatever it is. And we have Mario Brothers to thank for that and other things that have ruined the whole premise. But my old roommate used to play like uh, Bioshock, all these games, like post-apocalyptic games, and there's always like a really faint AM radio in the background of these games they all have that in common this had that but it also was really good for me it had if it was based on a video game or not i don't know apparently it is but i it doesn't matter to me if it is yeah there was a lot of online like they're not following the game when it does this and i'm like i don't care how your game played out this is a tv show and as tv shows go it was very compelling and if you're like i don't like zombie post-apocalyptic things It's not really zombie heavy. It's pretty much a character drama. Well, and the way... And a road trip, really. Yeah. And the way they did the zombie thing, which again, I'm not super on board with, the way they did it was quite a bit different than I've seen before, than 28 Days Later even, or some of these other zombie things, The Walking Dead. They explained exactly what was happening and why. And it was sort of believable enough that it didn't bother me why there was these basically walking dead around. So they did a good job of setting it up so that people like me would say, okay. Yeah. It was a little too relatable at some points, either intentionally or unintentionally. There was some familiar uh, COVID type of stuff. Oh, it's way COVID. Yeah. It's a COVID show, right? I'm sure they were like, uh, do you want a green like this? I don't know. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and it's like, hey, go for it. Yeah. I mean, this whole thing was shot during COVID too. That's crazy, because there's a lot of people in it in close proximity in some scenes. 
I guess a lot of it's just them out by themselves. But yeah, a lot of parallels. And, you know, it almost gives you a picture of what if COVID had been worst, worst, worst case scenario. This is uh, not far off, probably. This was a fungus. I'm not a scientist, believe it or not, but that <laughs> somehow, somehow the way they explained it, that's what I'm saying. It was like, okay, I'll buy that. Sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. Look, this show worked on every level. The two main performances are great. You end up caring about them and where they're going. Now, one of the big episodes didn't really focus on those two characters. It focused on two side characters that are in the game, apparently, but weren't developed as well. And that was episode three starring Nick Offerman and Murray Bartlett. Murray Bartlett was from season one of The White Lotus. White Lotus. He played the manager. This is the big episode that's going to win them all the Emmys. When they introduced Nick Offerman's character, I was like, man, I want that guy's life. Really? Yeah. <laughs> just eating steak and watching zombies walk into yeah, traps. Just self-sustaining off the grid. It was really cool. And then anyway, go on from there. It's a story about two men and their loving relationship over decades, pretty much, right? Well, 20 years. And uh, like everyone after it came out was like, oh my God, this is like, this is it. This is the best episode of any show in recent memory. And like I said, if you don't want to watch this show, just watch the third episode on its own. I have a little beef with that because it was on its own and it almost existed outside the show. I think it would have made a great short film, but it really did nothing to advance the show or the story. It was just this total side thing to me. Well, at the end, they make a cameo. I guess they got supplies from there or whatever, but it really... Yeah, but that letter he leaves for Joel lets him know, like, this is what you need to do. And it sort of like helps him set him on his course because he was kind of questioning whether he wanted to take her on this journey. And then it sort of just set it up. I don't know. I thought I it guess. was... Look, it worked. It worked, man. All right. Yeah, it was a great episode for sure. For sure. Now, can I say something about Pedro Pascal? Please. Because we're used to seeing him not uh, not his face because he plays the Mandalorian, as people know. Right. Now, my theory, and we already know that he's not in the suit most of the time. I don't know if he shows up to the Mandalorian set or not. How would you know? <laughs> <laughs> we both know a couple of people that play in the suit sometimes. I have a theory that Pedro Pascal's head would not fit in the Mandalorian helmet. You think he has a big melon? Yeah, and, there's, and he has really thick hair too, which is nice. But I don't know if he could squeeze into that helmet or not. You are correct, Joe. Just not about the size of his head. Pedro recently revealed that for season three of The Mandalorian, he was never on set and only did voiceover work. And that's another thing, too. His voice in this sounds like The Mandalorian, which I followed along with better because I recognized it. That movie I reviewed a while back, Prospect, yeah. with uh, J. Duplass. Great hidden gem, by the way, if you don't remember that episode. He didn't sound anything like The Mandalorian or this. He sounded totally different in that movie. So this was like, oh, yeah, that is the same guy. Also, the girl that plays Baby Yoda. Now, <laughs> there are similarities. <laughs> she's kind of funny in this show, too. She's oh, she's like, really funny in this show. She's great in this. Yeah. Did you get to the cannibals? You didn't get to the cannibals, No, I've only done you? three so far. You've only done three? I yeah. thought you said you loved this show. Well, I love, yeah, I'm going to finish it. Okay. I well, just it's good. Two nights it's ago. good. Yeah, it's very good. good. And then when it ended, I go, is that how the game ends? And my friends are like, that's how the game ends. So I've never finished a video game before. So I don't know. I don't play these games, man. Unless it's, you know, on my phone and one button, anything like X, Y, Z, you know, I'm like, I'm out. I have no dexterity or coordination to play any of these games. Yeah, me neither. So if it wasn't on Atari, I'm out. But everybody loves it. Congratulations, HBO. You had another hit. Obviously, I have to tell you, it's coming back for a second season. It got renewed right like right after the first episode premiered. They're like, this is great. Give us another season. And they have the game. There was a sequel to the game. So they'll just play off of that. All right. That is The Last of Us, season one, now streaming on HBO Max. And it is a binge. Okay. Can I just say something? Uh, yeah. We're clunky. We're rusty. We're man. rusty. Sorry, guys. We haven't done this in uh, six, seven months. Yeah. We'll get our mojo back. This is our fifth location, I think. Yeah. Fifth yeah. location in uh, I don't know how many. Oh, my God. We'll get through it. We'll get through it. It's okay. I'm looking at you, Joe. 
work with me here. I'm trying. I know. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm not giving you much, dude. I'm sorry. That's all right. Let's just put faith in our shows. Because I got a show right now that I love. Letting you know straight out of the gate, this is going to be a big binge. I had mentioned it last year that Harrison Ford was going to be doing a comedy. And this is that show. And I went in thinking Harrison Ford is going to be the worst part of this. He's going to be a disaster. He's going to be phoning it in. Boy, was I wrong. This is the best thing Harrison Ford has done that I can even remember. Better than 1883 or whatever? I did not watch 1832. Okay. Or 1833, whichever year that is. It's 1923. But I watched this and I was pleasantly surprised. This is Apple TV's shrinking from the people behind Ted Lasso, Bill Lawrence and Brett Goldstein. Bill Lawrence, who did Scrubs. Who did Scrubs and, obviously, like I just said, Ted Lasso and Brett Goldstein, who plays Roy Kent. Right, the actor on Ted Lasso. Who's also the writer on this. And also uh, was co-created by Jason Siegel, who's the star. I'm down for anything he does, always. Have you watched this? Of course I have. Oh, good. I've watched every episode. Great. It's fantastic. Oh, yes. Thank you. Every time I feel like you're going to disagree with me on everything <laughs> lately, like he's going to tell I me try. this sucks. I know. This is 10 half hour episodes already picked up for a second season. The cast is Jason Siegel, Jessica Williams, Luke Tenney, Michael Yuri, Lukita Maxwell, Krista Miller, and like I mentioned, Harrison Ford. Also, Ted McGinley, right? Yep. I love Ted McGinley. Great on this. Heidi Gardner has a reoccurring and our friend Matt Knutson. Also recurring. Also recurring. And if you follow him on social media, this is the favorite thing he's ever done as an actor. He loved doing this show. I posted on one of his things because he had a picture of him and Jason Siegel and that powder blue topless Bronco uh, that he drives in the show, which, you know, I have a Bronco, obviously. That's a vintage one. That's probably a $200,000 car. Really? Oh, yeah. The old restored vintage ones from the 70s. Yeah, they're super expensive. Anyway, the car is one of the great things about the show. But anything Jason Siegel I'm in, I like pretty much everything about this show. I disagree that Harrison Ford is the best part. I mean, he works. He works? He works. I, oh. I don't know. I know he's playing himself, but he's playing a curmudgeon. He's delivering, though. He's not Lawrence Olivier. He's not Robert De Niro. I realize that. And I know I'm a Harrison Ford apologist. I get that. <laughs> all right? I know. I, I, I But for me, and I'll admit, most of the time, he's been sucky. Look it. I'm telling you right now, just this one clip alone I'm going to play for you, I'm in. Fuck yeah, I want some pancakes. Come on, how can you not love that? Okay, That does make me want some pancakes. It makes me want to laugh, dude. That's my text alert on my phone now. <laughs> now, was that when he was stoned or whatever? That yeah, that's when he took edibles. Oh, and right. the next day he's uh, recovering from him when he's got the munchies. Yeah. But uh, here's the thing. Harrison Ford is a huge stoner. So to watch him get whacked out on edibles, knowing he's always whacked out to begin with, it's kind of meta. It's kind of weird. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the guy is a huge pothead. He's always <laughs> stoned. So he's stoned pretending to be getting stoned. That's he's, some quality he's work. method. He deserves an Emmy. He deserves an Emmy for this part, man. Okay. And well, he, oh, he's serviceable. He's well, fine. You know, maybe it's not him because I do have one problem with this show. And I, by the way, I love the girl from the Drew Carey show. The neighbor. Okay. Krista Miller is yeah. great on this. If you can get past the Botox. Yeah. Whatever it is. Whatever she did to her face, get past that because she's hilarious on this. Yeah. The one thing that I don't think always works on this, because every once in a while it'll jump out at me and be like, eh, is the dialogue. There are times where they're having a conversation and it's like, if I heard a group of people sitting around talking like that, I would think that they were AI robots or something. It's very, to me, the dialogue is not natural at times. It's a sitcom, man. Yeah, but I don't expect it to feel like family matters or something. It, sometimes it's too sitcom-y. Really? Yeah, for I me. like the dialogue. I thought it was fun. I know, I'll play a clip that's exactly what you're talking about. All right. Okay, here we go. 
How do you eat this shit? You've never had fun dip? No, I've never had fun dip. You just scoop up the sugar stuff with a stick, and then afterwards you can eat the stick. No shit? Yeah. Why do I have to pay you in candy? Because you're poor, and I like candy. Hmm. That's a good stick. That's good stick. Come yeah. on, man. It's, it's funny. Okay. It's okay. That wasn't really the type of thing I was saying bothers me. It, it's just more of like, first of all, when there's four or five people sitting around just perfectly playing ping pong with each other, it's like, that. Eh, it just seems out of whack to me from reality. But same way the Scrubs was. It's, it definitely has the Scrubs dialogue tone. People don't talk to each other that way, and it, it puts me off a little bit, that's all. It's kind of modern family influenced too, wouldn't you sure. say? A little bit. Yeah, but I, I never jumped out at me about Modern Family. Modern Family is ridiculous. Yeah. No one talks like that. Come on. Yeah, I guess. Maybe not. I don't know. Also, I think that the other therapist, what's her name? Gabby, played by Gabby. Jessica Williams. Yeah, who's great. She's great. I feel like that was two characters that they combined into one because she has two completely different tones at times. Sometimes she talks one way and is like one character... And then another times it's like, wait, this had to have been two characters that they squeezed into one because that happens. I'm sure it does. So she was a little all over the place for me, but she's very good. It just didn't seem consistent. I hear you. But so season one, you know, they'll find their rhythm. I thought it took two episodes to get going. At least. Yeah. I Al mean, although the pilot was, I think, the best episode. I didn't care for the pilot. The ending? The ending was good. Yeah. The ending was good. But I thought like, uh, I don't know. But I think by, you know, like I said, 10 episodes, I think by episode four, it's working on all cylinders. Yeah. I really liked it. Now, I didn't even say what it's about. Oh. It's about therapy. Um, Jason Siegel's character is a therapist. He works for Harrison Ford and his coworker is uh, Jessica Williams. They have an office. And uh, Jason Siegel's character is dealing with the death of his wife. And this whole show is really about dealing with grief. And it causes him to kind of change the way he practices therapy in a, in a way that could get him in trouble. So that's a lot of the through story. Right. But then you, the supporting characters take over. It's, I mean, it's about that, but it really, it's almost like a dysfunctional family in one way. You know what I mean? There's yeah. all these like characters not related, but they act like a family. Yeah, it is very much, even with the neighbors and the girl and the guy that moves in, it's all very, it feels like a big family. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. The thing that really works for me is the idea that a therapist would just lose it and be like, break up with them then or whatever. And that's kind of the, the point that he gets to where he's just telling his patients like, then why don't you whatever? And I don't think you're supposed to do that as a therapist. I don't think you are. I've never been to therapy. God oh. knows I could use it. Oof. But, uh, oh, you have? Huh? Have you been to therapy? No, I was saying you could use it. Oh, yeah. But also I have. And, and they definitely don't like tell you, you better do this or you're a moron kind of thing. And uh, the way he just goes off the rails and is like yelling at his patients, why don't you take the steps to change then instead of complaining about it all the time? Again, I don't think they're supposed to do that. And he could get in trouble for it, especially the very, very end of the series. The very, very end. The last. Yeah. It's a literal cliffhanger. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we'll see if that comes back uh, to bite him. But I liked that concept. The whole premise of the show is great. Yeah, it moves fast, too. And the thing is, like, I looked forward to it. I was a little behind. I watched the first three, and then it was weekly. As soon as it was available, I watched it. And I laughed a lot. When Jason Siegel dances or sings and dances or does his little goofy thing to try and make his daughter laugh, he did the same thing in the Muppets thing and in I Love You, Man. He is so physically funny when he wants to be. Okay. I'm glad you uh, like his dancing. Demo's That's awesome. nodding. Wonderful. On Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 81 with the critics and an 85 with the audience. Sounds about right. I mean, it's not like the greatest show, but I went in thinking it was going to be a train wreck, and it's not. It's a lot of fun. It's sweet. It's good natured. And I laughed my ass off. I also give it a binge. That is shrinking all episodes streaming on Apple TV Plus, and this is a binge. Okay, that felt a little better. I feel like uh, a good show got us going here. We both were excited about that one. We were excited. That helps. That helps. I feel, I'm, I'm fired up now, man. And you know what I'm fired up for? What? A voicemail. 
Oh, from, from last year? From last year. This comes from listener Megan Gianella. Here we go. Hey guys, listener Meg here, just sending in a voice memo so that Demo can stop complaining that we're all too lazy to help him out. Love the show. Uh, recently watched The Offer on Demo's recommendation. I actually got Paramount Plus temporarily in order to be able to watch it, and it was a very good show. Uh, I did enjoy it a lot. Won't be reinventing the wheel here, but um, definitely a worth the watch. Um, definitely a binge. And Matthew Good really was Matthew Great. That was an amazing performance, and it was a fun look behind the scenes of a classic. So um, thanks for the recommendation. That was nice of her to call and leave that. I still haven't watched The Offer, but everyone says it's really good. You need to watch The Offer. All right. Right? Well. She took our advice. She yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, listener Meg. We totally appreciate it. Joe, where can people send us their voicemails? It's super easy. Get your iPhone out, make a voice note, email it to binge or purge podcast at gmail.com. Or they can call Demo's cell, which I had. If I had it memorized, I'd give it out right now. No, don't call me just, and don't text it to me. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah, just to email. Play it. Just email them, right? Yeah, binge or purge podcast at gmail.com. And it doesn't even have to be a voicemail. You could write us a, a recommendation too if you don't want to record. But we prefer the voicemail so we can play it. Yeah. Don't you want to hear your voice? Yeah. Millions of people. Of course. Yeah. All right. Now it is your turn. What do you got, man? Oh, I am excited about this next one. Since the last time we did this, this is the best thing I've seen. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, wow. Real. Holy it, cow. This is not my BoJack Horseman uh, self-indulgence episode, but it's almost to that point because there's only one season and there only will be one season. This is George and Tammy on Showtime. This a TV movie or a series? This is a mini series. Okay. It is six episodes only, one hour. I wish it had been more. It's based on a book called... I can't remember the name. The Three of Us, Growing Up with Tammy and George. This is about George Jones and Tammy Wynette. Now, Demo, do you know who either of those people are? I do. Okay. Yes. You're in the minority, first of all, My in LA. My grandparents were big country music Western fans. Both country, country and Western. What did I just say? Country music Western? Is that a thing? <laughs> sure. Country Western music? You know, in Blues yeah. Brothers. Yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> they say Look, I had to like sit through Hee Haw as a kid, oh. okay? And they would be on there occasionally, Straight right? Straight to Hee Haw. You know what, Hee Haw? Like, I hated it, but I think if I went back now, I'd go like, wow, some good looking women on this show. <laughs> don't you think they had some cute women on the show? I didn't, sure. I was five. I was like, I don't know what's going on. I just remember I hated Hee Haw. It was that and Lawrence Welk I was subjected to every weekend at my grandparents' place. But that's how I know who you are talking about. Okay. Back to your earlier comment, you could probably use some therapy. Uh, it sounds like you, there was a lot to work out in what you just said. But anyway. Yeah. Minnie uh, Pearl. Remember Minnie Pearl? Yeah, I do. Blues Brothers, the movie. And they go to that roadhouse bar and they say, what kind of music do you guys play? And they say, we play both types, country and Western. Uh, That's what that reminded me of when you said that. Anyway, George Jones, one of the most successful early country music guys. It was around the time of Elvis. Uh, he was fantastic. Raging alcoholic. Really, really bad. The opening of the show is a little glimpse of that. And it's uh, very realistic, I think, to some degree. And he ends up getting up on stage, barely, and just knocking it out of the park. And I think that's maybe how some artists are wired. That's kind of a through story with the whole thing with him and his self-destructive behavior. So he got into a relationship with Tammy Wynette. They got married. She was actually with somebody else at the time. They had a very tumultuous relationship, to say the least. And this was in the wake of him as his star was uh, beginning to set, I guess, and as hers was on the rise. Sounds like a star is born. Yeah. I'm sure that that's where that movie came from, was this story or something like it. Well, no, because that movie's concept's a million years old. Well, so is this, this. art imitating life and life imitating yeah. art, right? But this was set in the late 60s, early 70s. So it's around the same time, I guess. Yeah, but there's a version of A Star is Born from like the 1930s, dude. Oh, really? And then there's the Judy Garland one. Yeah, you're probably going with the Chris Christopherson, Barbara Streisand version. Right. That's from the 70s. Okay. But it's it's the same story over and over again. And look, at yeah, this is two people. A tale as old as time. A tale as old as time, yes. Anyway, let's talk about who's in this. And, and by the way, the first episode of this 
this is interesting, aired on Paramount, the TV channel, and then the rest the of it. streamer? No. Oh, Paramount, the channel. Oh, right. The yeah. cable channel. Okay. One episode on cable, then the rest only on Showtime, which you have to subscribe for, or just subscribe every 30 days and then cancel it. They haven't, I guess, figured that out yet. So it's definitely worth getting Showtime for, even if you do have to pay the six bucks for a month. It's only six hours of shows. Well worth it, 100%. Who else is in it? Who's in it to begin with? How about that? Not who oh, else. I'm sorry. Yeah. Michael Shannon plays George Jones. Sold. Yeah. I'm right? In. That's Me it. Me too. Let's go. Me Michael too. Shannon. Done. Everything after Take Shelter, uh, Waco. I mean, he's been in, he's for some reason very underrated. I don't know if he has a bad agent or he what. He works a lot. He's in everything, yet he doesn't come to mind as like this awesome actor that everybody knows. That, that works in his favor, man. You I know what I mean? I don't need him to become some huge superstar. Just should. keep doing the work he's doing, right? He should. He also played Elvis in a movie called Elvis and Nixon, which nobody saw. It was on Amazon. I watched it when I had the flu or something. Really good show, too. Anyway, so he plays George Jones. Jessica Chastain, Academy Award nominee. Academy Award winner. Academy Award winner plays Tammy Wynette. And she actually won a SAG Award for this performance, and she was nominated for a Golden Globe. She should have won all. She, they both should have won. I don't know how he didn't get any uh, recognition for this. I don't know if he upset somebody in Hollywood or what, but they both were so good. So, so good. How's their singing? That's the thing. So I read an article about this. They took all kinds of voice lessons. Everything you hear, it's them singing, and it's not uh, auto-tuned. It's not anything. It sounds like two people singing. It doesn't sound like it's recorded, even though I'm sure it is pre-recorded. They just let them do it live, and it sounds like it probably sounded in real life. It reminded me of, remember the Bill Murray Christmas special where there's mistakes, there's uh, little things that kind of make you know that it's real. Uh, This had some of that, where it wasn't always perfect music but uh it was great it was such a great portrayal and his story was tragic hers ends up being even more tragic uh for different reasons but anyway uh michael shannon was not originally going to play george jones do you know who was new josh brolin oh okay he would have been okay i think but michael shannon just knocks it out of the park brolin ended up producing it by the way all six episodes directed by john hillcoat who had mostly done music videos before this, uh, country music videos, Bob Dylan, uh, some other stuff. So it was a interesting choice and director, but man, the way this is shot, Demo, it is like adrenaline. Some parts of it are like edge of your seat, riveting, you know, when he's getting ready to go up in front of a big crowd. And there's like stress while you're watching it. And then there's some very loving moments, but it, there's this undercurrent of dread because he's always hanging by a thread of he's going to just self-destruct any minute. And then the stuff develops with her and you just feel so bad for these people because they're both really tragic figures. Uh, one of them turned their life around and died that way and the other one didn't. Who else is in it I was going to get to? Steve Zahn. Love Steve Zahn. Guitar player from that thing you do. <laughs> Among other things. And White Lotus. Walton Goggins. Yep. And Katie Mixon. Anyway, I loved the crap out of this thing. I was hoping it would be a lot bigger than it was. It got good reviews. Not many people have Showtime or apparently were willing to go get Showtime. I have Showtime and I I really, this just didn't stand out to me. Because like you said, she gets nominated for a SAG award as George and Tammy. And I'm like, what the hell is this? I didn't even know when it came out. I didn't even heard about it. If you watch the first one, you'll be hooked. It's so, so good. Favorite thing I've seen since the last time we did this and maybe even beyond. George and Tammy on Showtime. Absolute binge. We've had three binges. I know. Wow. I don't know if we've had that in quite a while. We haven't had anything in quite a while, I I guess. I know, but here's the thing. We got one more, and what do you think? Is it going to be a binge or a purge? I don't know. Let's find out. Let's find out. What is it? I have another show about music. This is a fictional account of a rock band from the mid to late 1970s. The show is called Daisy Jones and the Six. 
It's a limited series on Amazon Prime, 10 episodes, about an hour each. It is based on a best-selling book from 2019 by Taylor Jenkins Reid, and it was picked up by Reese Witherspoon's production company. She's an executive producer on it, and showrunners are Scott Neustetler and Michael Weber, and those are the guys that wrote 500 Days of Summer, which okay. I love. Really? Yeah. No? Zoe Deschanel. Zoe and- Deschanel and uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Wow. Okay. That's a great movie. Okay. It's, it's in heavy rotation right now on HBO. Okay. It's like, I've seen it's it. On. I yeah. love it. I All love right. it. The script is great. The direction is great. I love that movie. Okay. And everybody knows out there, 500 Days of Summer, great movie. You're in the wrong on this one. I didn't say it was bad. I just It was surprising that that's... Anyway, go anyway, on. I love it. Also, another producer on this is Will Graham, and he... Oh, is the showrunner on A League of Their Own on Amazon that you liked. That was very good. Yes. So that's who's behind it. This is loosely based on like Fleetwood Mac and Stevie Nicks. Well, I heard it's not that loosely based. Isn't it pretty much based? No, I would say it's loose. Okay. You see the similarities for sure. But look, these are almost like a one hit wonder when it gets down to it. In this story, this band only put out one album. Now, this stars Riley Kehoe, who is Elvis's granddaughter. You knew that, right? Is that how you pronounce that? Kehoe? Kehoe. Okay. I listened to eight different clips okay. of All her right. pronunciation so that when I came to do this, I would get it right. You're braver than me. I've, I've never said her name out loud because I knew I would get it wrong. Well, it's complete. I know. I look at it. I'm like, Kehoe? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's not the right letters. That, that ain't it. Riley Kehoe. And then another guy whose name I had to work on, ready? Sam Claflin. Okay. All right, okay? This is what I spend my time with, figuring out how to pronounce these people's names. Now, I got an easy one. Camilla Maroney. She's some model that Leonardo DiCaprio apparently dated when she was 12, all right? (laughs) I'm not kidding. It's like, you know him. Hey, hey, Leo, at this point, stop dating women that were born after Titanic came out. Can we agree on that? Yeah, and no, I get it. I get it. I'm not saying you got to, you know, date someone your age, but I mean, seriously, right? They can't go, oh, Titanic, I missed that in the theaters, but I caught it on streaming. Like, no, you yeah, know. Sorry. I get it. All right. Okay, anyway. Suki Waterhouse, Will Harrison, Josh Whitehouse. Oh, we got a Waterhouse and a White House. I'm just noticing that. Huh, interesting. How about that? Yeah. Sebastian Chacon, and then another one I spent... A lot of time in this one, Nabia B, close enough as I'm going to get. It's N-A-B-I-Y-A-H, Nabia, Nabia. That sounds more like it. Let's go with Nabia. And then in a recurring part, Timothy Olfant, who's oh, great, yeah. Love right? Him. Not in and enough. 10 episodes, the first two and a half to three, dreadful. I almost was like, I'm not going to get through this show. This was so boring. And you're waiting, because you know, like, you got this singer, right? This one girl, and she's off doing her thing, and then you got this up-and-coming band, and you know from the first scene, they're going to get together and become this powerhouse group. But they spend forever with the backstories till they get together. Once they finally do get together, Riley and Sam, they play uh, Daisy Jones and Billy Dunn. They're like the, you know, the front men of the band. And it's basically their relationship and their conflicts and how they love each other, but they hate each other. And because of that, they write this great music together. And then it goes through all the cliches, like, you know, 70s rock band stuff. Mm. But go watch Almost Famous, dude, because you can get the whole story in a way more entertaining fashion in two hours than the 10 hours of this. Because once it finally starts getting good, it's over. And you're like, this is it? Like you keep waiting for like something epic to happen and it never really does. This show doesn't have much of a pulse. People are like, oh, I'm loving Daisy Jones. It's so great. And I love the music. And the music in it is good. There's an original music written by this guy, Blake Mills. And they're saying like there were co-writers of Jackson Brown, Marcus Mumford, and Phoebe Bridgers. They all contributed. But this guy, Blake Mills, wrote most of it. And uh, Riley and Sam, they perform their stuff live. They're singing. You can actually go buy the album. They released a soundtrack and all that stuff. Great. 
But as a showman, I got to tell you, it's a purge. Don't get me wrong. I liked some parts of it, but it just never took off. And it's such fertile ground for something exciting. You know what I mean? Loosely based off of Stevie Nicks and get crazy into the drugs then, right? Go nuts. You know, you know that urban legend about Stevie Nicks, right? And the cocaine upper butt. I thought that was uh, Richard Gere. No, that's the hamster. Oh. The urban legend was that uh, she had done so much coke that it wasn't like affecting her anymore. So she had to have someone take a straw and shoot it up her butt. Oh, yeah. She disavowed that. She said that never happened. I don't know where that, that's total bullshit. But in the meantime, I read that Rod Stewart would do that. <laughs> he said that him and some guy from the Rolling Stones, I can't remember, I think it was maybe Ron Wood or whatever, they would take pills, empty out the caplets, fill them with the Coke, and then stick them up their butt. He was worried that Coke going up his nose would affect his singing voice. Oh, his septum, yeah. Yeah. Smart. So he, he, yeah, right. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> you, you also know the other uh, thing about Rod Stewart, right? The, he had to have his urban, stomach pumped. Right, which is which he addressed in his book and said that didn't happen. But I definitely sure. put pills up my butt. If there's a story about that happening to anybody, it happened. Where'd the story come well, from then? His manager. He fired his manager and then all of a sudden he noticed like this rumor was going around and he figured out that his manager was so pissed off at him that he started this. Well, that's what I would say too. If something like that happened. I believe the man. All right. Rod Stewart or yeah, the manager? Rod Stewart. That's your prerogative. Now, I only have one experience with this thing, which is that someone asked me about it and here's the exact tone that I was asked. Are you watching this Daisy Jones in the sixth thing? <laughs> Was that me? No, it wasn't you. It was someone else. But that made me not want to watch it. And then I heard there's a really graphic scene that got a lot of uh, controversy or something. Really? A, a sexual assault or something in it. I read something about it. I don't remember that. It was like, did it go too far? It's something a publicist planted, I'm sure. Nothing in this show went too far. Demo says not far enough. Yeah, I'm, I've wanted something crazy. And for a show about rock and roll... It should be a lot more vibrant and off the rails than it is. It didn't really give me anything new in terms of like the 70s scene. And uh, what can I say? Daisy Jones and the Six streaming on Amazon Prime. It's a purge. (laughs) Okay, I believe you. I'm not going to check it out, I don't think. Uh, Should we recap real quick? Yes, please. Okay, so we started with The Last of Us on HBO Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's uh, already seen it. It's yeah. not like news to anybody oh, listening. I just started it. Okay. Just on your recommendation. Uh, if you haven't, then definitely start it. It's a binge. Let's see. Then the second thing was... Shrinking. Shrinking, which we both loved. Love Apple it, TV. love it, love it. Harrison Ford is great. Harrison Ford is fine. <laughs> He's okay. The whole show is great, though. Jason Siegel, I think, is the best part of the show and his Bronco. They work great together. They do. It's almost a father-son relationship, yep. and it's very believable. I'll yeah. give him that. And that's on Apple TV+. Plus. Ten half hours. Was yes. Uh, third, we had George and Tammy, one of the favorite things that I've seen in a long time on Showtime. Uh, Six episodes, one hour. Please go watch it. I I rarely say please watch it, but this one really is worth the watch. And lastly, we just talked about Daisy Jones and the Six on Amazon. Not bad. Not enough there for you to commit to the time. It's a purge. And I had already forgotten the title of it, by the way. That's why I pointed at it. It's a weird (laughs) name. I'm getting, is there five other, six other people in the band? Well, there were five people and then the photographer and they're, let's call us the six because we're only five. And then Daisy Jones joined. So there's actually seven, I think. It's ridiculous. Like the Ben Folds I'm five. I'm sure the book is great, but it just didn't translate. Okay. So Ben Folds five is a purge. Uh, that was it. That's all our shows for this time. Uh, we'll do some more next time. And I don't think it'll be uh, eight months in between shows this Hopefully time. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. I think we got a little better as the episode went on. I'm going to have to, whoo, <laughs> I'm going to have to work some magic to make this one seem exciting because yeah. sorry, folks, we're a little rusty. I got to spray some WD-40 in my mouth and uh, yeah, mine too. clean us off here. Or have CV Nicks blow it up your butt or whatever. <laughs> All right. As always, we want to thank Just the Facts. You can follow Just the Facts on Instagram at the Jesse Greer. That's Jesse with a Y. So for Joe Taylor, my name is Demo. This has been Binge or Purge Streaming Reviews. Thank you so much for coming back and listening, and we'll see you next time.
Fuck yeah, I want some pancakes.